In this video, I will review Chapter 13. Chapter 13 deals with media economics and the global marketplace. We know that the mass media is everywhere. The questions Chapter 13 poses are, what are the economic conditions of the mass media and what role does the government play in determining who owns what and who should be allowed to own what? In my last video on Chapter 1, I discussed how just a handful of huge media conglomerates own 90% of American media. Is this fair for consumers to have 90% of the messages that they get, whether it be in music or TV shows or newspapers, 90% of their messages essentially controlled by six or seven corporations? Does that restrict the voices in the media? To try to understand these questions and how this can occur, we need to understand the structure of the media industry. Looking at the structure of the media industry, most media companies are set up in one of three common structures, monopoly, oligopoly, and limited competition. A monopoly is when one single company dominates production and distribution in a particular industry. In an oligopoly, just a few firms dominate an industry. And limited competition characterizes a media market with many producers and sellers, but only a few products within a particular category. At the turn of the century, there were many monopolies in place. Railroad, shipping, steel, and oil industries all controlled by single organizations. AT&T is a more recent example of a monopoly. For more than 100 years until the mid-1980s, AT&T ran the telephone business until the government forced it to break up and form smaller companies. An example of monopolies on the local level are cities where there's only one newspaper, or maybe two newspapers owned by one company, or where only one cable company operates. A good example of an oligopoly is the music industry, which is controlled by just three international companies, Warner Music, Sony, and Universal. These three companies really only compete with each other. There are a few small companies, but they're not very competitive. These big companies add new ideas or products by buying successful independent companies. And finally, limited competition a media business structure with many producers and sellers, but only a few products in a particular category. An example is radio. There are hundreds of radio stations across the country, but they only feature a limited number of formats. All news, like the CBS station that I worked for, rock and roll, country, sports, smooth jazz, and just a handful more. Advertising dollars, which keep radio stations on the air, have decreased, so you don't get many startup radio stations anymore. And those that are on the air are going to use a very commercial format, a format that's known to get listeners to make the most money they can. You won't find many polka rap stations. When assessing the performance of media organizations, analysts look at how they make money, how they set prices, and how they live up to society's expectations. Also, analysts take a look at how the media companies function with the Internet now in play. For some companies, the Internet has helped their business, but for others, it has helped put them out of business. Newspaper publishing is a struggling industry. Who buys a newspaper when you can read the news on the Internet for free? Media companies collect revenue in two ways through direct payments. A direct payment is when the media company directly makes money from the consumer who purchases a product like a book, a DVD, a song on iTunes, or a movie ticket. And indirect payments. Indirect payment is money collected through paid advertisements. The customer is an advertising executive who buys space in a newspaper or airtime on a radio station to promote a business. Many media companies make money through both direct and indirect payments. 
Cable TV is an example of a media industry that earns its money both directly from subscribers who pay monthly cable bills and indirectly from advertisers who buy commercials to run on the cable channels. When evaluating the media, economists also look at other elements such as costs, marketing strategies, and regulatory practices. They ask the question, are media companies doing business fairly for the consumer? And they inform consumers when they don't think a media company is doing business fairly. For example, in 1996, economists looked at the inflated price of a CD. A CD sold for $13 and economists felt the price should be lower. They use the economies of scale principle. If you mass produce something, the price should come down. Music companies were mass producing CDs, but they weren't lowering the price. In 2003, Universal finally lowered its CD prices by about a third, but only at discount retailers and Amazon. To this day, most retailers still charge $13 for a new CD. Turns out, that's bad business. Most record and CD stores are out of business. So here's a question. The more product you make, the cheaper the cost per unit. That principle is called blank, and it works unless prices are blank. Take a guess. I'll give you a few seconds. The answer is A. That principle is called economies of scale, and it works unless product prices are artificially inflated. Critics and watchdog groups insist that mass media live up to certain expectations, that they introduce new products and technologies, that they make their products and services available to people of all economic levels, and that they're aiding in society, being the public watchdog over wrongdoings. Consumers are informed when mass media falls short. I mentioned earlier, near the turn of the century, numerous monopolies existed. Monopolies are not good for consumers. The consumer has no options. The companies have no competition and can set prices as high as they want. Near the end of the 1800s, the government began moving in and breaking up monopolies. The government passed a law that divided up Standard Oil into 30 smaller competing businesses. This was one of a series of rules and regulations that were established called antitrust laws. The idea was to make sure consumers had more choices and ownership was diverse. Around 1950, the U.S. began to move out of the modern period and into the postmodern period. Over the past 60 to 70 years, we've transitioned from being an isolated nation with U.S. manufacturers competing with other countries, other nations, to a new cooperative global economy. Today, U.S. automakers have car plants all over the world, and foreign automakers have plants here in the U.S., including Hyundai in Alabama. This postmodern period includes the transition to the new information age. So here's another question for you. What was the original or historic purpose of antitrust laws as declared by the government? Well, the answer is there. It's C, to ensure diversity of ownership among competing businesses. Prior to 1950, Government regulation was seen as important to the growth of competitive businesses. But through the last 50 years or so, the tide has turned away from regulation. Economists began to think that regulation interfered with the flexible flow of capital. And in the 1970s and 80s, we saw deregulation take hold. Deregulation began under Jimmy Carter in 1977. It included the loosening of laws, fewer controls on business. And deregulation continues today, and it's had a major impact on mass media. For one thing, deregulation has led to the lifting of restrictions on how many radio and TV stations one company could own. As a result, radio and TV ownership consolidated into huge conglomerations that we have today. And this led to massive layoffs in media companies. Fewer jobs and deregulation also means fewer voices. 
In 2007, the FCC relaxed its rules further and allowed for the first time for a broadcast operation to own a newspaper in the same market. Again, less competition and fewer voices for consumers. The same company can own the newspaper you read in the morning and the news you watch at night. The deregulation movement has returned media to 19th century principles, which suggested that markets can take care of themselves with little or no government intervention. And most media companies have been able to avoid monopoly charges by buying diverse types of mass media rather than trying to control just one form of media. And if they do have a monopoly, such as owning the only newspaper in a city, they do so at the local level, which doesn't violate federal monopoly laws. Disney is a perfect example of a diverse, gigantic media conglomeration. It provides programming for TV, cable, movie theaters, Broadway shows. Disney says that's a good thing. It provides quality programming, which only benefits consumers. But what happens when news ratings for Disney-owned ABC drops? Does the Disney CEO take a pay cut? Or are reporters laid off? We are seeing other trends that characterize what's happening in the media industry. Today, we have more flexible markets, and that means moving away from the days of Henry Ford, where you had stable mass production of products like auto factories that resulted in mass consumption. Today, executives know ideas and fads are fleeting. They come and go, and you have to be flexible. This flexible economy has resulted in expansion in the service sector. Companies know there is a need to serve individual consumer preference. The flexible economy relies on cheap labor and demands rapid product development and efficient market research. We also see a big decline in the number of people who work in the labor unions. We just don't have the same kind of manufacturing of goods like we used to. This is the information age, no longer the industrial age. But this also has meant significant downsizing going on everywhere, but especially in mass media industries. Downsizing is supposed to make companies more flexible and more profitable. But of course, there are problematic results beyond just higher unemployment. Companies are no longer able to compete due to too few employees. The main beneficiary of media consolidations are the CEOs who get huge paychecks resulting in a significant wage gap between the CEOs and the average worker. In 1950, a CEO earned 25 times the average worker's pay. Today, a CEO earns 39 times more than the average worker. Why doesn't society complain more? Why don't we revolt? Ancient Greeks have a concept for the ability of the wealthy to rule over the poor with little protest. It's called Hegemony. Hegemony is the acceptance of the dominant values in a culture by those who are subordinate to those who hold economic and political power. People simply accept the system of beliefs put in place by those in power. We accept it without question. People used to believe that the world was flat because that's what they were told. It was considered common sense. And today, this concept still works and the media helps. The whole idea of common sense shows up in the media in the form of narratives, storytelling, and we buy into it. The media sells common sense and plays up middle American virtues. In TV shows, books, magazines, movie characters are heroes who are loyal, honest, and hardworking. Today's new global economy brings with it the rise of specialization. TV became the dominant media in the 60s and 70s. Magazines and radio and cable industries were forced to look for other specialized markets to counter the mass appeal of TV. We now have magazines and cable channels just for people who like fishing or cars. By the 1980s, even television had to embrace niche markets when the Internet started taking their profits, targeting a specific demographic mostly young adults. 
In addition to specialization, media giants also rely on synergy. Synergy is the promotion and sale of different versions of media products across the various subsidiaries of a media conglomerate. Synergy is the default business mode of most media companies today. Disney is the perfect example of a postmodern media conglomerate. Disney epitomizes the synergistic possibilities of media consolidation. Consider Disney's Frozen. It's a movie, a musical, a theme park ride, a DVD, and an ice show, just to name a few. All of its subsidiaries work together with interests worldwide. This new global economy equals global audiences. International expansion has allowed media conglomerates some big advantages. They are reaching a worldwide audience. And globalism permits companies that lose money on products at home to recoup those losses from profits abroad. For example, movie studios generally don't make a profit on the domestic box office alone. The foreign markets are needed to help movies make a profit. Another social change we are experiencing in this information digital age is something called cultural imperialism. The U.S. has cornered the market when it comes to dictating styles of fashion, food, and media fare. The U.S. media dominates the global market and its culture has been embraced internationally. But this puts a severe burden on countries attempting to produce their own cultural products. It's hard for them to compete. But defenders of American popular culture say that because our culture challenges authority and old outdated traditions, this creates an arena in which citizens can raise questions. And having universal popular culture creates a global village and fosters communication across national boundaries. But critics complain the U.S. is dumping our culture on other countries, and this prevents the development of original local products. And while our pop culture can be viewed around the world, two-thirds of the world can't afford to take part in our types of culture, and this creates a cultural disconnect. And finally, Chapter 13 examines the media marketplace and how it impacts democracy. The media today is made up of multinational, billion-dollar conglomerates. We live in a society of often superficial consumer concerns, looking at stock market numbers and corporate investor returns. These issues tend to dominate the media instead of more important, broader social issues. Plus, mass media mergers have also created a dysfunctional relationship with politics. Politicians regularly accept contributions from the massive media conglomerates, and this makes public debate over economic issues involving the media difficult. There is a conflict of interest. This consolidation of mainstream media power is causing concern, and there is a movement underway to reform big media by various groups, but there's not been a large public outcry for the media to do a better job. The main reason for there to be a large coordinated effort to change the media, any form of meaningful discussion would have to be carried out in the popular media. And most media organizations are not interested in airing its own dirty laundry. So that's a review of Chapter 13. Be sure to read Chapter 13 yourself, review the study guide, and complete your blog assignment on the discussion board for Chapter 13. Chapter 15 is next. You'll take a quiz at the end of this week that has questions covering chapters 1, 13, and 15.